Well, good morning again, Chapel family. Uh, great, great day to celebrate today. So congratulations again to all those who were baptized. We support you. Let's just show them our support one more time. <clears throat> So yesterday was also a very special day uh, for my family. Actually, my oldest son was married yesterday. I think there's a, <laughs> see the picture up there. <clears throat> so I had the, I had the privilege, uh, you know, I've, I've officiated uh, a lot of weddings, never one quite like this. And so to be able to be part of uh, Paul and Katrina's day was really, really joyful. Out on the dock at our favorite lake. And so this was actually the small, kind of very small family wedding, the big ones next spring. But uh, they didn't want to wait, and uh, just thrilled to have them, have them married, and uh, uh, just a, a moment to step back and reflect on God's goodness to us. So I appreciate your prayers for God's blessing on, on their future together. So we're taking the summer to walk through the book of Psalms, and we've been saying every week, the Psalms really speak to emotion. They, they, they touch on um, just about any kind of emotion or life experience that, that we go through, and the the emotion or the experience that today's psalm speaks to is one that people struggled with back then when it was written, but I think people struggle with it today uh, a whole lot more because it's a psalm that really provides an answer for confusion, confusion. So there's a a really popular uh, YouTube channel called The Pursuit of Wonder, and uh, it's it's a channel that promotes an existentialist philosophy. Some of you might remember from your college reading uh, authors like Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus and, and others who, who espouse this existentialism. That's what this website's about, um, this YouTube channel. And last time I checked, they had about 2.1 million followers, so it's really popular. And I just wanted to read you the beginning, the script from the beginning of one of their really popular videos. This is what it says. Now more than ever, we are exposed to a plethora of ideas about life. The internet has made it so we can consume a seemingly unending amount of content on the topic of living most effectively. However, simultaneously, this access to information has also allowed the consumer to realize just how conflicting most ideas are. In the West, which is where we live, the popularity of traditional religion has reduced as a result. And for many, the increasing access to information has revealed that the world is basically without any discernible truth, and most ideas about how to live are inconclusive and unreliable. It is fair to speculate this could be a major contributing factor to the modern world's increasing levels of anxiety, cynicism, and disillusion. Choosing between conflicting ideas of how to live has always been an issue for the individual. But in the modern world, where conflicting ideas are constantly smacking us in the face, now more than ever, we can often find ourselves failing in our attempt to find footing in this reality. That's pretty spot on, don't you think? I mean, just getting smacked in the face from different ideas, different thoughts. Um, You would think that having access to all the information of the world through the internet would be making us so smart and so wise, right? I mean, it's right there. It's on our phones. We can find out anything we want. It just seems to be making us more confused. Now, this is, as I mentioned, an existentialist website or, or, or YouTube channel. So the video goes on to say there really is no meaning in life. You need to just face that reality. And so stop trying to find some absolute truth and and create meaning for your life. You have to come up with a way for life to make sense for you. I don't know how that strikes you. To me, that doesn't seem like a solution to confusion. To me, that's just more confusing. And so the question is, how do we make our way through? I mean, it's just gonna keep getting more confusing in our world. Is there any way through it Um, Or are we just going to continue to just get lost in the mire of the confusion? Psalm 119 is an answer to that question. And Psalm 119 answers it in in kind of an extreme way. We've been saying every week the Psalms are the longest book in the Bible, right? 150 chapters. Uh, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the longest book of the Bible. This one chapter is longer than some entire books of the Bible. I mean, it's massive. But what makes it unique is not just its length, it's actually carefully laid out as what's called an acrostic poem. So 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, each letter has a section devoted to it, eight verses per letter, and the first word in each of the verses in each section begins with that letter of the alphabet. Anybody totally confused yet? So the point is, it's really poetic, it's really carefully composed, it's really long, but the whole thing has a single theme 
It's all about how to find clarity amidst the confusion of life. We're obviously not going to read um, the whole psalm. That would take all morning. So let's just read verses 9 through 16. That, that, that will give us a good, a good representation of this psalm. As I read this, see if you can find some reference to Scripture, the Word of God, in every one of these verses. So Psalm 119, beginning in verse 9. I invite you now to hear the word of God. How can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to your word? I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. And this is the word of the Lord. So did you hear a reference to scripture in every one of those verses? If you read through, uh, by the way, anybody know how many verses are in the whole Psalm without peeking? 176 verses. In this one psalm, if you read through those, I believe all but four or five have a direct reference to Scripture. So it's a very unique psalm. So if I had to summarize the teaching of Psalm 119, uh, here's what I would say. The answer to confusion is to delight in Scripture. The answer to confusion is to delight in Scripture. Not just read the Bible, not memorize a bunch of verses, not get your theology straight. The answer to this world where conflicting views are smacking us in the face all the time is to actually delight in scripture. And you know what it means to delight in something, right? Like my son, Paul, delighted in his bride, Katrina, yesterday. It means that you're just so looking forward to something, that you are savoring something, that you want to tell other people about it, to delight. The answer to confusion in life is to learn to actually find delight in scripture. So let's ask a few questions about that. First, Let's talk about why. Why should, why should we delight in Scripture? Three big reasons from Psalm 119. First, guidance. Guidance. Verses 104 and 105. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. In other words, the more time that we delight ourselves in Scripture, the better decisions we're going to make. We'll see certain paths as clearly wrong, so we won't bother even wasting our time going down those paths. You're having some struggle of a decision in life, and your friend says to you, hey, why don't you go make an appointment to see that astrologer on Route 23? I heard she's really good. And you know from Scripture that that's just a wrong path. And so you don't even need to think about it. You say, it's just not for me. I'm just not doing that. And so your mind begins to be guided by by Scripture, by the principles that are in there. So you become driven less by outward appearance and more by what's in the heart. You become driven less by financial gain and more about deeper things. You become driven less by avoiding pain and suffering at all costs, and you do the hard things sometimes. You just find that that your path sort of gets lit up, and decision-making becomes more clear because of the Word of God. Famous, famous uh, autobiography of uh, St. Augustine, the great theologian of the fourth century. Um, His autobiography is called The Confessions of St. Augustine, and he tells the story of his conversion. So Augustine grew up in a home with a a Christian mom, but pretty early in life, um, he became an atheist. And he wound up highly educated, just this brilliant, driven, um, really fiercely intelligent young man, living a really promiscuous, wild, partying life. So he talks about a day when he was 31 years old. He was feeling utterly empty, just utterly, uh, just, just searching in life. He wasn't satisfied. And he was walking outside, and he heard a child's voice singing over and over, take up and read, take up and read. And he thought, what is that? I've never heard that song. Is that some kind of kid's game? Take up and read. He kept hearing, take up and read. He didn't know what else to do, so he went and found a Bible, and he picked it up, and he just... Um, in his mind, randomly opened it up, and it opened up to Romans 13. He says, this is the words that he read. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ 
and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. That's what he read. And in his, his book, he, he, he says, I didn't have to read any further. It was like a light of peace shone into my heart and the darkness of doubt vanished away. And it was at that moment that his life just turned and he followed Christ with all his heart. He became one of the influ- most influential Christian thinkers and leaders in, in really all of the history of the church. I don't necessarily recommend the open the Bible wherever it randomly opens, and that's God's word for you for the day. But it just reminds us that the word of God is powerful, and it guides the direction of our life if we're listening, if we let him do that. So delight in scripture because it guides the way we live. It gives light to our path. Secondly, strength. Strength. Psalm 119, verse 28. My soul is weary with sorrow. Ever ever been there? Strengthen me according to your word. Scripture has this amazing ability to speak at us, especially at times when we are weary and discouraged and maybe fed up and beat up and weak. I, I figured this out a long time ago because of the opportunities that I had to visit people in hospitals. That's something we pastors get to do is to, to visit people in hospitals. And um, it's a funny thing, visiting people in hospitals, because um, it's a little bit awkward. Um, they're lying in a bed. They're wearing a gown. Um, they probably haven't bathed in a day or two. Their hair is messy. Just a perfect time to entertain guests, right? Just, oh, come on in. Um, but I remember when, that, when I first was a pastor, I felt like I had to come up with this brilliant words of wisdom. Like, oh man, I got, I got to tell them something that really powerful here. And I realized pretty soon that I was putting way too much pressure on myself. So here's, here's what I tell young pastors now. Four rules for hospital visitation. Number one, show up. Like, it's good to show up. Number two, don't stay too long. Because when you've got tubes coming out of you and you know, you're know you bad breath, you don't want someone to hang out for an hour, so get out pretty quickly. Number three, pray for them. And number four, read scripture. Because that's where the authority and the power and the gravitas is to encourage people and lift people up. And so I have a, a, a group of scriptures, you know, a, a five or 10 scriptures I tend to go to depending on where that person is and, and how they are. To, to, to bring strength to them through the word of God. Um, one of those scriptures is so important to me personally and goes way beyond time in the hospital, times when I feel weak, times when I feel beat up. I just very often preach this to myself. Um, so there are mornings when I just feel, you know, something's going badly in life. I just feel discouraged. And so I think of Isaiah 40, verses 28 to 31. And, and I will either standing by the window with arms outspread or on my knees, I will just recite the scripture. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. And then here's where it blesses up, blesses us. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even young men grow tired and weary. Youths grow tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will rise up on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And I'm telling you, I I mean, I've probably heard those words 500 times. Even now, as I hear the words of scripture, I can feel strength just entering into me. There's just power in the word of God. So don't think, if, you, if you're feeling weak or if you're ministering to somebody who's feeling weak, don't think you've got to come up with this brilliant you know, words of wisdom. Go to the source. Go to scripture. That's where the power is to give strength to the weary. And then third, delight in scripture because it brings freedom. Freedom. Psalm 119 verse 45 says, I will walk about in freedom for I have sought out your precepts. That's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? Like, Lord, the reason I feel so free is because I'm, I'm really into your rules and laws. Feels like it'd be the opposite, right? Like laws and precepts and, and, and rules would kind of confine us. They would constrict us, right? You would think that you're most free when no one's telling you what to do. You could do anything you want. But that's just not how human beings were designed. Tim Keller said it like this. 
Modern people like to see freedom as the complete absence of any constraints. But think of a fish. Because a fish absorbs oxygen from water, not air, it is free only if it is restricted to water. If a fish is freed from the river and put out on the grass to explore, its freedom to move and soon even to live is destroyed. The fish is not more free, but less free if it cannot honor the reality of its nature. Freedom is not so much the absence of restrictions as finding the right ones, those that fit with the realities of our own nature and those of the world. That's pretty good, isn't it? So if it's true that the same God who breathed life into you is the same God who breathed out scripture, right? 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture is God breathed, breathed out by God through human authors, but supernaturally breathed out by God. If that's the same God, then it would, it would make sense. Then living by the guidelines of the Bible won't stifle us. It'll, it'll release us. And that's what the psalm writer means here. Because I'm all about your precepts, God, I find I'm just walking about in freedom. So why should we delight in Scripture? Because it guides our steps, helps us make right decisions, because it gives us strength, and because it frees us to live the kind of lives that we were meant to live. That's why we should get up in the morning fired up for what God is going to show us. Like it says in Psalm 119, open my eyes, Lord, that I may see wonderful things in your word. All right, let's get a little more practical. Second point, how? How is it that we should delight in Scripture? And Psalm 119 tells us three main ways we should interact with the Bible. Here's the first one, meditation. Meditation. This is a huge concept in Psalm 119. Verse 148 says, My eyes stay open through the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promises. And you find verses like that all through. So what does that mean? What does it mean to to meditate on Scripture? Well, first of all, it means it's not about speed reading. It's not about, i got to read my four chapters today so I can make it through the Bible in a year. It's not about that. That's just way too much information to really focus in on something that God is saying. So it means taking a short passage of Scripture, short enough that you can really give it the attention it deserves, and think deeply about it. Chew on it. Compare it to other things. Like, oh, this reminds me of what Jesus, didn't Jesus talk about this back here? Oh, this connects with what Paul said over here. So you're assimilating it with other things that you know about the Bible. You're talking to God about it. God, I think this is what you're trying to tell me, right? Oh, how would this apply with this thing I'm about to do today? It becomes a conversation with God. Ever since the weather got, you know, nice-ish in the spring, it, it's become this great routine I, that I tend to take up every spring that I'll spend time in the morning um, reading scripture and making a few notes, kind of, kind of drawing some, some ideas from it. And then I just go out and walk for about a half an hour. And during that walk, it's, it's the greatest, I meditate actually much better when I'm moving, maybe slight ADD, than when I'm sitting still. And so for 30 minutes, I'm just walking around. And, and that scripture that I really made sure was, was imprinted on my mind, that's the topic of my meditation. So I'm thinking about it, talking to God about it. I make that the prayer that I'm praying for myself today. Um, I pray that over my family members rather than just bless them, Lord, you know, protect them. It's whatever that scripture said. That's what I'm praying that they'll live out, that they'll, they'll, they'll uh, internalize that. I usually have about six or eight people on my prayer list for the day. Not just, Lord, give them a happy day. Whatever he showed me in scripture, that's what I'm praying on them. And so I'm talking, I'm praying. That scripture is being chewed on. That's what meditation is. I cherish, those are some of the greatest times with the Lord, literally walking with God. If you think about it, meditation's a lot like, lot like food, right? I mean, if you want to, you could probably scarf down dinner in five minutes, right? It, I, I can't, I'm just, maybe a confession. I can eat really fat, fast if I want to. Anybody else fast eater? If they, you know, if they let themselves, you know, I could just put it away, dinner's done, I'm on. But it's not much fun, right? Isn't it so much better when you have some time to just savor the textures and the flavors and the spices and the sauces, right? Like a burger sizzling on a, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make it worse for you. But not only is it more enjoyable, but it's, it's healthier, they say, when you chew more, when you slow down, it nourishes your body more. That's just how we were meant to take in nourishment, savoring it, slowing down. It's the same thing with God's word. 
Um, when we take the time to chew on it, to think deeply about it, it honors what the word is. It goes deeper into our soul. So meditation is such a, it sounds almost so intimidating and monkish. It's not. It just means think deeply about it. Secondly is obedience. Psalm 119 talks about obedience almost constantly. Actually, from the very beginning. We didn't read the first two verses. Look how it starts. Verse one, blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. Do you notice all the living it, obeying it, walking according to it, right? So the Bible's not meant so you can just gain a lot of knowledge about God, even so you could get correct theology or you know, spiritual wisdom. The Bible commands our allegiance. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, the Bible calls us to do some hard things too. It says, love your enemies, pray for people who are giving you a hard time, right? Uh, forgive people who, who persecute you. It calls us to, to honor our parents. It calls us to be generous with the poor. I mean, it calls us to do th- some things that cut against our natural grain. Sometimes things that are really culturally unpopular. Sometimes when you're reading the Bible and you walk away from it, it's just going to be a choice of your will, of your regard for God, whether you will walk in his ways, whether you obey what you just read. But it always produces blessing when we do. And then thirdly, perseverance. Perseverance. Psalm 119 teaches us, as you delight in Scripture, you need to persevere in that keep doing it. Why why would it say that? Well, because the world is getting darker and opposition to Christ and his church is getting stronger. And so as the world turns more secular, more self-absorbed, it will be more difficult to hold on to the truth of scripture. There'll be more pressure. There'll be more marginalization and dismissal and mocking of those who hold on to the word of God. And so when that happens, Psalm 119 speaks to us and encourages us. For example, verse 23, though rulers sit together and slander me, your servant will meditate on your decrees. Or similar in verse 61, though the wicked bind me with ropes, I will not forget your law. You hear the like, I'm going to keep doing this, right? So, so you might be in a position where you're being dismissed or, or, or disrespected because of, of your faith. In fact, if you're following Christ, that will happen. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, believe me, they're going to give you a hard time too. If you're following me, it's not going to go so well for you all the time either. So that's going to happen. Maybe you find yourself in a position like that where you're being, you're being mocked or you're just being shoved aside. And Psalm 119 is this encouragement. Hey, keep, keep going to the word. Keep forming your convictions, not based, on, not based on, on blogs, not based on chatter, not based on politics. Keep forming your views on the word of God and hold firm. God will go with you. Keep on going to the word, to the truth. Persevere. So in the face of all the confusion out there that's always smacking us in the face and contradicting each other, the solution is to delight yourself in scripture. Let it, let it guide you along your path as you walk. Let it strengthen you when you feel weak. Let it free you to be the person. That's the water you're meant to swim in is, is the truths of scripture. So meditate on it, obey what God calls you to do through it, persevere in it. That's where clarity comes from in confusion. But I got to say one more thing, um, because there is one more aspect that is actually more important than, than, than anything else I've just said. So let's talk about this third thing, the ultimate purpose of delighting in scripture. So it does all the things that I just talked about, but there's actually something more personal that you open yourself up to when you delight yourself in the word of God. So I I wanna show you something. Let's go back to the very beginning of the Psalm again. Psalm 119, verse one. Um, Listen to this. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. But now watch this, verse four. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Anyone notice what changed? starting in verse four. For the first three verses, the psalm writer was addressing whom? Like us, the listeners, right? So he's talking to us, the listeners, about the word of God. But starting in verse four, he starts directing his words to whom? 
to God, to God. And for the whole rest of the psalm, the, the remaining 173 verses, all of this is directed, Lord, oh God, to God. This, this thing's like one long massive prayer. And when I saw that, I realized this, this writer is not just delighting himself in the word of God, he's delighting in God. You know, when I was a freshman in college, I decided to try to maintain um, a long distance relationship with my high school girlfriend. It is so hard to explain to younger people today how radically different that was without cell phones, right? I mean, it, I mean, the person was like gone and she was going to a college 500 miles away from me. So, all right, this was gonna be something to maintain this relationship. Like, you know, you have to really work at it. So I remember distinctly, I can still almost smell that dorm mail room. Have you ever seen one of those? And like the old wood and stuff, and, and the, guess the smell of all the envelopes and stuff. And I remember taking my little key and opening up that mailbox and like looking in. And when there was a little card or a letter from her, my heart kind of leaped, left a little bit. And I would take it back to my room, you know, where I could read it in privacy. And I would open up that envelope. And I remember, um, you know, kind of, kind of smelling her perfume. I, I don't know. Did she actually, did you ever just put, put perfume on the letters? I don't, it smelled good. Uh, <laughs> And seeing her distinctive writing, you know, on there. And, and I cherished those, those letters. In fact, true confession, I have all those letters in a box in my house. Um, don't tell my wife. No, it's the same person. She's, <laughs> she wrote them. I have all those saved. I'm not telling anyone where they are. It would be very embarrassing if somebody found it. Probably more embarrassing to you. But... Uh, I, I, I cherished those letters because they, they weren't just cards and letters. It was like an extension of her heart what was on those letters. And so when I would open them and read them, it's almost like she's sitting in the room with me. Guys, you know, the word of God can actually, it, it is actually that. <laughs> and we can actually realize that, that when you read the word of God, it's not just, it's not just you know, oh, there's people's thoughts, they're imperfect. This is the very heart of God. If you read about what, Scripture says about itself, how Jesus regarded Scripture. This is the very heart of God extended to us. It's an amazing thing to spend time in the presence of God through his word. And so just like I saved, you know, those old love letters, I've actually saved a bunch of the Bibles that I've had over the years. I just wanted to take a minute and just give you a little glimpse into my journey today. Um, so I decided uh, to bring these. So really quickly, this was the first Bible that was given to me. Uh, it's actually uh, dated in the front June of 1973. I was six years old, given to me by my first grade Sunday school teacher here at the chapel. Um, old King James Version. I don't know what they were thinking. I understood, like, <laughs> what? But, but I did look at the pictures a lot and, uh, and, read, and read some of it and I think carried it around to church and stuff when I was a little kid. I've lost my second Bible, unfortunately. My parents got me a living, do you remember the living Bible? It was called The Way, they called it. Back then I was like 10 years old. And that was great, because it was in words that I could understand. And, and I read a bunch of the New Testament, especially. When I got off to college and God really got a hold of my heart, I think my friends and I were trying to impress each other with the size of our Bibles. So I got this beast, uh, it's New American Standard. And I look back in it and I look at the notes and the highlights and the things that, that God was showing me. And I'm just so glad I have this to, I don't use it that much now, but, but just to see sort of some of my spiritual journey in it. So when I got to, uh, when I decided to go on to seminary, um, I got this new international Bible and just read the heck out of this thing through seminary. And, uh, and early in my time on, on the mission field when we served in Eastern Europe. And uh, again, notes, underlines, um, things that are really precious to me to look back on. And then, uh, after I got back to, uh, uh, to America and started serving at the chapel in the mid to late 90s, I got another NIV Bible. It used to be a burgundy cover. It fell off after a while. And I heard about this great place that you could get your Bible rebound. This is before, uh, still before the internet. So I don't know. I went to some book bindery and it was such, I got so ripped off and it, it fell apart quickly. So it's really kind of junky. But the Bible itself is, I got a bunch of blank pages put in the back and, I, and I've written in there, um, some pretty important things. A lot of prayers that I prayed that God answered, um, experiences that I had as I reflected on scripture. Um, this is a really, really precious Bible to me. And then uh, um, about uh, 20 years ago, I decided to 
um, expand a little to the English Standard Version. So I bought this other very large English Standard Bible, read, read this a lot for about 15 years, love that translation of the Bible. And then just this last fall, um, I got this NIV Bible, which is, I, lo I love this Bible. I, this is the one I bring into hospital rooms. This is the one I bring to gravesides and, and that I read every morning. Um, and it's such an important part of my life. So I share that all with you just to say that this is, this is really precious to me because they've been my companions through different seasons of my life. But much more importantly, morning by morning, page after page, through these pages, I have communed with the God who loves me and who guides me. Um, and that's just been such an amazing thing. That, that has made me who I am more than anything else. So look, we're living in a really confusing time, right? I, I'm convinced that is the main reason why there's so much anxiety, why there's so much depression, uh, because nobody knows what to believe anymore. But through the chaos of all that, God is calling you to delight in his word, to meditate on it, to obey it, to stand firm in it, to let it guide your path, to let it strengthen you, to let it free you to be the person that you were invented to be. But most importantly, God is inviting you through his word to encounter him personally. There's just nothing better that a person can do. Would you rise for a closing? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your holy word. Thank you that through it, Lord, we encounter the living word, Jesus Christ, and we actually spend time in the presence of our God. I pray, Lord, for each of us that you would give us a delight, a hunger in your word, that we'd wrestle over it, that we would grow deeper, we'd grow more mature through the eternal words of scripture. And Father, through that, through our time with you, may you make our character more and more like Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to walk out these doors and represent Jesus really, really well. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.